let me introduce the Professor Yunnan Xia. Uh, Professor Xia is a Brock Family Chair and Georgia Research Alliance, eminent the scholar in nanomedicine at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He received the PhD degree in physical chemistry from Harvard University. Professor Xia Group has invented many important nanomaterials, in particular, silver nanowires are now commercially available for broad application. His group, the further explore the use of electrospun nanofiber for important bio application. Professor Xia has published 790 papers, each index is 198. He has now named a uh, top 10 chemist and material scientist. He received a number of prestigious awards. He served as an associate editor of Nano Letters from 2000 to 2019. And please welcome the Professor Xia. All right, uh, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, um, this is Yunnan Xia from Georgia Tech. Nice to meet you all online. Uh, this is a very difficult time. I, I hope everybody is doing well under this current pandemic and things will go back to normal very soon. First of all, I would like to thank Professor Ido Kim and other organizers for putting together this fantastic program. So today I'm going to talk about colloidal matter nanocrystals. Specifically, I want to discuss how we can achieve controllable and predictable synthesis for this class of very important nanomaterials. When we talk about the starting point of nanotechnology, we often cite the speech made by Feynman in the late 50s. The fact is, nano has been widely practiced by chemists, chemical engineers, physics, and even biologists long before that speech was delivered. For example, colloid science has been around for more than 100 years. It refers to the study of small particles with sizes in the range of a few nanometers to a few micrometers. If you have visited uh, some of the historic cathedrals in Europe, I'm sure you would be impressed by the beautiful ruby red color displayed by the glass window. This striking red color is caused by gold-based nanoparticles embedded in the glass. And this coloration mechanism is also responsible for the creation of a piece of art known as the Lacoche's cup. Depending on how you shine light on this cup, this cup can display two different colors. And more than 100 years ago, Michael Faraday actually reported the first chemical synthesis of gold colloids, which display a beautiful ruby red color instead of the yellow color typical of bulk gold. 50 years later, uh, me offered an explanation based on surface plasma resonance. Basically, that's the collective oscillation of conduction electrons uh, in metal nanoparticles. For gold nanoparticles of 40 nanometer in diameter, they have very strong absorption around 520 nanometers. As a result, we would observe the complementary red color from a colloidal suspension of gold nanoparticles. More systematic studies suggest that the shape of a particle plays an even more important role in controlling the position at which the resonance will occur. For silver nanocrystals with roughly the same size, the peak can be shifted from 400 nanometers all the way to 800 nanometers when the shape is changed from sphere to triangular plate. The shape also determines how the electric field is distributed on the surface. For a spherical particle, the local electric field, but for a cubic particle, the field is typically concentrated at the corners and the intensity could be uh, more than 10 times stronger than that on the spherical particle. This examples demonstrate the critical importance to control the shape 
of man and nano crystals. Heterogeneous catalysis is another forerunner of nanotechnology. For more than one century, we have relied on catalysts based on metal nanoparticles for the production of many chemical, pharmaceutical, and petroleum compounds, as well as for the protection of our environment. The catalytic particles also play a critical role in energy conversion, as shown here for the fuel cell technology. For most of these catalysts, the key component is metal nanoparticles with diameters as small as a few nanometers only. You probably have noticed that both plasmonics and the catalytics rely on the use of precious metals as shown over here, which are unfortunately very limited in terms of supply. As the demand for these elements increases, there's an urgent need to find the most efficient way to use them uh, in commercial products. So let me use platinum as a typical example to support my argument. This metal is widely used in a broad range of industrial applications with the demand dominant by catalytic converters. Like other precious metals, platinum has an extremely low abundance in the Earth's crust approximately about five micrograms per kilogram of raw material. That's the reason it takes a lot of efforts to just harvest a very tiny amount of uh, platinum. Annually, we only produce 180 tons of platinum, and that's about one-tenth of that of gold. And if we collect all the platinum we have mined in human history, and mail them to cast a cube. That cube only measures 6.3 meters on each side. So for this reason, it has been a major challenge to develop new commercial products uh, based on this element. So for more than one decade, our research has focused on the development of cost-effective electrocatalysts for fuel cell applications. So as a zero emission technology, fuel cells hold a great promise for future transportation. Different from electric vehicles, it only takes a few minutes to fill an empty tank with hydrogen gas, and then you can drive for more than 400 miles. One of the major barriers to the larger scale commercialization of fuel cells and fuel cell vehicles is the cost associated with the platinum-based catalysts necessary for speeding up the oxygen reduction reaction on the cathode. At the moment, platinum-based catalysts contribute to uh, roughly one-third of the total cost of each vehicle. Our strategy is to maximize the mass activity of this catalyst by optimizing the size, shape, and the composition of the catalytic particles. When nanocrystals are synthesized with different shapes, one can actually control their surface structure to make sure the most effective facet will be expressed at the crystal ratio or proportion. For such an approach to work, of course, the size of the nanocrystal has to be controlled about five nanometer in diameter. Otherwise, the proportions of atoms situated on corners and edges will be dramatically increased. So about seven years ago, we developed a method for the synthesis of platinum nickel alloy nanocrystals with an octahedral shape and covered by one on one facet on the surface. So when tested as a catalyst for oxygen reduction reaction, its, specific, its area specific activity can be increased by 50 times relative to the commercial standard. The mask activity can also be increased by almost 20 times 
And this makes it possible to significantly reduce the loading of platinum uh, in the future fuel cell vehicles. Through this example, I hope you are convinced shape control plays a very important role in the development of cost-effective cost effective and sustainable catalysts uh, for future applications. So now let's discuss how to control the shape of metal nanocrystals. So although Michael Faraday pioneered colloidal synthesis of metal nanocrystals more than 160 years ago, it was still a major challenge to control their shape until about two decades ago. So here shows team image of silver nanocrystals that was reported in year 2002. And this sample was so poorly dispersed, non-uniform, you cannot even find two particles that sh share the same shape or size. Uh, thanks to the efforts from the many research groups, the situation has completely changed in recent years. So now we can easily obtain colloidal metal nanocrystals with uniform and well-controlled shapes. So of course, such a control comes from a mechanistic understanding of the nucleation and the growth process. So during a synthesis, the atoms are typically generated from a precursor compound through reduction or decomposition. So once their concentration has reached supersaturation, the atoms were aggregated to form nuclei and then seeds. Depending on the experimental conditions, the seeds may take different internal structures, such as single crystal ones and singly twinned, multiply twinned, and stacking for the line structures. The seed will then grow and eventually evolve into nanocrystals with different shapes, as dictated or controlled by the experimental conditions. So for example, when there is a capping agent that can selectively bind uh, to the 100 facet, the single crystal seed will grow into cubes to maximize the expression of 100 facets. Otherwise, these single crystal seeds will grow into octahedra enclosed by 111 facets because they are the lowest in terms of surface free energy. So under certain conditions, the symmetry of the seeds can also be broken or reduced, leading to the formation of anisotropic nanocrystals, such as nanorods, nanobars, and nanowires. So despite the remarkable progress, it's still impossible, I have to say, uh, to predict the outcome of synthesis. So if you have ever conducted such a synthesis, I'm sure you will appreciate tremendously what I'm going to talk and uh, discuss in the next uh, 30 minutes. So a typical synthesis of colloidal nanocrystals involves many, many variables, and each one of them may affect the outcome of a synthesis. These variables may include the type and the concentration of precursor and the reduced agent the solvent, the capping agent, the colloidal stabilizer, pH value, and the temperature, of course. While all these parameters can be quantified and precisely tuned, the unknown impurities in chemical reagents can ruin the synthesis completely. So in address this issue, our recent study suggests that the efforts or the effects from all these conditions including impurities, actually can be collectively measured using one single parameter, the reduction rate of the synthesis or reduction kinetics. So our results indicate that the reduction rate can be used to predict the outcome of a synthesis. So in this example, our synthesis was based on polyol reduction. Oops. Well, the reduction kinetics can be tuned by varying the chain length of the polyols in addition to the temperature. So first, let me show you how we can measure the kinetics, all right? This is a typical physical chemistry problem. So basically, we can just follow the concentration of the precursor remaining in the reaction solution after a certain period out of time. And we can analyze the concentration using UV-based spectroscopy or 
ICT mass measurements. And then you can plot their concentration as a function over time. And eventually you can do curve fitting and obtain the kinetic parameter, including rate constant, and also the activation energy if you run the measurements at at least two different uh, temperatures. So here I show you two typical examples. One was conducted in acetylene glycol, and the other was conducted in diacetylene glycol. So as you can see, the intensity of the precursor or absorption peak will decrease as a function over time, but they're going to decrease at a different rate because these two different polyols have different uh, reduction powers. And then we can do fitting by plotting the log of concentration as a function over time, and then you can fit together the rate constant. So here I just show you the rate constant we have measured for these two different systems, or for three different polyols, uh, including EG, di EG, and uh, tri EG, basically. We also, for each polyol, we run the measurements at a number of different temperatures. So that's why we can eventually obtain the activation energy. So once we know the activation energy, and then in the future, we can easily calculate the rate constant at the temperatures you don't have even to do uh, the measurements. So what's really interesting uh, is that when we analyze the products from this different synthesis, we obtain a very clear correlation between the internal structure of this nanocrystals and the initial reduction rate. Because once we know the rate constant, we can just consider the initial concentration of precursor, and then we can find the initial reduction rate. So it turned out to be very interesting for very fast reduction with reduction, initial reduction rate uh, higher than 10 to minus 4. Basically, you are going to obtain single crystal nanocrystals. And then you are going to obtain icosahedral ones with multiple twin structure. And then at the lowest region, you are going to obtain this stacking for lined nanocrystals. So here I just show you uh, TEM images of these typical examples. We obtain in different solvents or at different temperatures. So here I just show you high resolution TEM, just confirm uh, the line are uh, the stacking for line structures, multiple twin structures, and these single crystal structures. So basically we believe uh, for each matter, okay, there should exist a similar type of correlation. So in the future, by controlling the initial reduction rate, we will be able to control the internal structure of the C. And then we can control their gross behaviors or patterns and eventually you can have very precise, even predictable control of the shape taken by the nanocrystals. So um, of course, so far we have been able to only uh, work out uh, the case for palladium. So now we are of course trying to extend this to silver, to gold, and all different noble metals. So basically in all these cases, we only need to measure their reduction kinetics and then check the products and then you should be able to obtain a more or less similar uh, correlation. Of course, the exact range should change depending on the matters. So that's basically going to uh, become uh, quite uh, quantitative control in, in terms of uh, predicting the outcome from a synthesis. So even you have impurities in your reagents in the future, we can also make a prediction because it doesn't matter as long as you stick to the same agent, those impurities should just affect the reduction kinetics in the same way. Of course, when you switch to different regions, you probably need to do measurements again to get the rate constant. And then that will allow you to uh, make predictions. So uh, knowing the kinetic information also allow us to get a good understanding about the gross behavior of nanocrystals. So basically here I show you the gross patterns of palladium cubic seeds whose side faces are covered by capping agent like bromide uh, in this particular case. And we find that the final shape or morphology taken by these nanocrystals is going to be determined by the two kinetic parameters. 
One is the deposition rate. That's how fast you put atoms onto the surface. And the other is uh, the surface diffusion rate, uh, how quickly the atoms can migrate to other sites on the surface of the seed. And when the deposition is much, much faster compared to diffusion, basically the atoms are going to be accumulated at the site of original deposition, like at the corner size in this particular case, because the side faces are covered by the capping agent. So eventually this seed will grow into octocots, for example. And then when the surface diffusion, uh, diffusion becomes faster, and you're going to see atoms being able to diffuse to the side faces, and eventually you can form a perfect core shell nanocrystals. In this case, uh, this final product is just a duplication of the original seed. The only difference, of course, the surface composition is going to be changed. Of course, when the surface diffusion is too fast, they may change their morphology or shape, and the cube can even become octahedrons. So uh, for this caution and the crystal shown over here, actually, that has been uh, our focus over the past uh, five, six years, uh, because we really want to uh, take advantage of this caution and crystals to develop new catalytic materials. So here, just show you some TM images corresponding to these four different situations. So you can have octopods, and you have caution and crystals, and then you have a uh, shape transition from cubes to octahedrons. And when we focus on this caution on the crystals, uh, I just want to emphasize the importance of surface diffusion. Because before we publish this work, actually, uh, people always had trouble to generate perfect caution on nanocrystals because they always observe uh, island growth or this dendritic growth uh, on the surface. And the major issue over there was really surface diffusion you really have to accelerate the surface diffusion, and then you are going to be able to make caution nanocrystals. This caution nanocrystals provides an avenue to significantly enhance or like uh, uh, increase the diversity of nanocrystals that we might have. Because in this case, we, can on, we only need to put a few layers of the new matter on the surface of the seeds. And then you are creating new nanocrystals with different catalytic properties. And by controlling the facets or shapes of the original seed, you can also have an easy way to control the facet and the shape of the final products. Basically, the final product is supposed to be a duplication, replication of the original surface structure. So you can easily access new composition and the new surface structure, and of course, new uh, catalytic uh, properties. So here I'll just show you some examples. Uh, this is palladium cubic seeds. You can put different layers of platinum on their surface. You can have six layers, four layers, and one layer in this case. You can also switch to different types of seeds like octahedral seeds, and you can do the same thing. And for octahedral seeds, uh, the surface diffusion will be uh, much easier compared to cubic seeds because the surface is smoother. So that's why you can also even use aqueous system uh, to achieve this uh, conformal uh, deposition and the coating and eventually form this caution nanocrystals. And even you can run this synthesis in one port instead of in these two separate steps. Okay? You don't have to make seeds and then do coating. Okay? You can just mix all the precursors together in the same port, in the same reaction container. Of course, the trick over here is you have to have a good control over their reduction kinetics. Again, reduction is, uh, kinetics is very important. So in this case, if the palladium precursor will be reduced at a much faster rate, more than like 10 times faster than the platinum precursor, and then this palladium will be reduced first to generate the seed. And then the seed will serve on uh, the surface for the deposition of platinum. So basically, you can also form uh, caution nanocrystals. If you change the precursor, if the reducing power or uh, re re the reduction kinetics uh, become compatible between these two capping agents, uh, between these two precursors, and then of course, you are going to make alloy nanocrystals. Okay, so basically, you can have a control if you know the reduction kinetics of these uh, different precursors. 
So here just show you team images of the core channel and the crystals. It's actually equivalent to what you can synthesize uh, in two separate steps. And by knowing, by knowing the reduction kinetics, you can also control the shape. You don't have to just make octahedral nanocrystals. You can also make uh, icosahedral seed, and then you put the platinum on their surface. Also, this can be done in one step, in one port. In, in this case, you have to switch the precursor from SM glycol to uh, tetra SM glycol. And then, it, because of the reduction kinetics, they are going to just form this icosahedral seeds, and then eventually you are going to form this uh, cochlear nanocrystals. So these cochlear nanocrystals also serve as precursors to a new class of catalytic materials known as nanocages. They are hollow, and also on the surface they have pores. So basically, you can access uh, their inner surface. So for these nanostructures, you can consider them as something equivalent to graphene or carbon nanotube, these kind of ideas. But basically, you can put all the atoms on the surface to achieve maximum utilization efficiency uh, for the atoms. And what is good, um, these kind of nanostructures can also be made relatively compact, and then they can put uh, on catalytic support, so you can achieve uh, various significantly improved catalytic performance. So here I show you uh, how we can synthesize this kind of nano cages. Uh, basically, when we deposit the platinum on the surface of the palladium seed, in reality, you always have interdiffusion between the core and the shell. So, so you can have some matters from the core being trapped inside this shell. And these trapped atoms actually can serve as the channels for the etching in the second step. So that's why eventually it can etch away that matters in the core, and eventually you're going to observe, uh, you're going to obtain these hollow nanocrystals. But the surface of these hollow nanocrystals is going to still have well defined facet. That facet is going to be defined by the original seed you used for platinum uh, deposition. So here I just show you two typical examples. One is in the cubic shape, and the other is going to be in the octahedral shape. Uh, their surface are covered by one of facet uh, and one on one facets uh, respectively. You can also do similar coating on icosahedral nanocrystals. Um, in this case, after etching away this palladium core, you can obtain this uh, hollow icosahedral platinum nanocages. And for icosahedral nanocrystal, they have unique features that make them very important for catalytic applications. Because on the surface, you have all these uh, twin boundaries. And on the surface, uh, then you are going to have some compressive strings. So as a result, these nanostructures are going to give us a significantly enhanced catalytic activity. So for pure platinum icosahedral nanocages, as you can see over here, their specific activity actually is more or less similar to the PT nickel alloy uh, octahedral nanocrystals I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. So, but in this case, we don't have to involve platinum, uh, we don't have to involve nickel because nickel is too reactive. During the operation of fuel cells, nickel could be easily leached out. So eventually the catalytic activity will decrease uh, very significantly. So by switching to uh, nanocrystals or nanocages made of pure platinum, they can show uh, significantly enhanced durability in addition to the catalytic uh, activity. In this core shell and the nanocage nanostructure systems, also provide the avenue to engineer the crystal structure, not just the surface structure, okay? Because you can imagine if you have a matter that has a different crystal structure uh, from the core you are using, and then when you deposit these matters onto the core, they are forced to take the crystal structure of the core. So eventually you can change their crystal structure. So that's exactly the situation shown over here. When we deposit ruthenium, on palladium nanocrystals. Ruthenium has a HCP structure. So when you deposit on palladium, which has an FCC structure, 
the ruthenium atoms are forced to take FCC structure instead of uh, the bulk HCP structure. So when the palladium core is etched away afterwards, you are going to obtain ruthenium nanocages in the new crystal phase. Okay, that's completely different uh, from the conventional bulk uh, ruthenium. And uh, you can also extend this idea to different shape nanocrystals so you can control their crystal structure and the surface structure in the effort to optimize uh, their catalytic performance. And interestingly, for these nano cages with very thin shells and also with these metal stable crystal structures, they can be stabilized actually to a temperature as high as about 350 degrees. So this gave us a lot of room actually to use them in many catalytic applications, as long as the temperature can be kept below 350 uh, degrees Celsius. And uh, right now we are also exploring some of their applications uh, in like uh, uh, nitrogen reduction. And in particular, through DFT calculations, we found that uh, some of these nano cages with the light, right surface structures they can provide a very effective catalyst with much lower uh, activation energy barrier compared to the catalyst currently used in the industry. So maybe in the future, this can survive, uh, can supply a very uh, active, at the same time, a durable catalytic system uh, for nitrogen reduction and in the synthesis of ammonia, which is a very important uh, chemical compound uh, uh, um, for many applications. So this is the last slide for my uh, presentation. So in this case, I would like to stay away from science when I talk about the technology. So this is really about uh, the scaling up issue, okay? If you make a very tiny amount of nanocrystals, you can do very detailed characterization and then you can write a few publications, that's fine. However, if you want to explore their industrial applications, in particular in catalysis, and then you are going to have uh, trouble because all, all the times uh, they need quite large amount, okay? Could be kilograms, could be hundreds of kilograms of these nanocrystals. So uh, when you do scaling up, actually, uh, people used to think about, you know, increase the volume of reagents and the reaction container. And this won't work for nanocrystal synthesis because whenever you increase the volume and the size of, of the volume, uh, the volume becomes so large and it will become problematic to achieve mixing. And also heat transport will be another issue. So as a result, the product quality will be compromised when you scale up the, uh, the ration volume. So in, instead of going this direction, we are going into an opposite direction. So we are reducing the volume of this ration solution to smaller droplets, but we are going to create millions and millions of droplets and in a continuous fashion. And then we can run synthesis in each one of these droplets, and then you can collect a sample at the end, and basically uh, you should be able to scale up this uh, very uh, easily. And um, here to show you a typical idea, you can take your reagents, first you have to mix them, uh, you are going to put them in these tiny droplets, and then you let them go through the oil bath. You can trigger the reduction or decomposition reaction, and they are going to generate uh, nuclei seeds and nanocrystals. And um, if this condition is well maintained, and the final product is going to be identical among all these different droplets, so that's why you can maintain the quality. This will be continuous uh, production. You don't have to interrupt it. You can also have multiple devices uh, uh, ongoing simultaneously. So here to show you an example, you can see it. Basically, you have this uh, region droplet introduced in this oil mass. If you look at it carefully, you can see the color change. After coming out from this oil mass, they become black in color instead of the yellow color because you already have nanocrystals are being formed uh, in this system. So here just show you a typical example. This is a similar platinum nickel alloy octahedral nanocrystals I show you at the very beginning. So basically they can serve as very active catalyst for oxygen reduction reaction uh, for fuel cell applications. But in this case, we can easily produce them 
uh, on the scale of hundreds of grams per hour, okay? So basically you should be able to uh, uh, reach the scale needed uh, for commercialization. And uh, also, um, we have done tests on this catalyst. Um, naturally, their performance are essentially the same as you obtain using uh, batch reactors. But in this case, it's going to be uh, in a continuous fashion. So thank you for your attention. And finally, I would like to just thank uh, the funding agencies, uh, including NSF and the DOE, uh, for the financial support. And uh, I will be more than happy to uh, take some questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, the Professor Yunnan Xia. Then now time is the open for question. Then uh, let me share the the question, the Q and A. Then uh, here, so we have one question. So could you comment on the role of the polio the during polio synthesis? Specifically, is there a difference between different type of polio? So, Yunnan, uh, could you yeah. comment on this? Okay. So, in terms of polyosynthesis, um, let me give you this slide. So, basically, if you have different chain lengths, uh, these polyols are going to have different reduction power. Typically, the longer the chain lengths, the weaker the reduction power. But the detailed mechanism is still unknown, actually, uh, because the real reducing agent in the polyol synthesis is the oxidation product from this polyol. They are going to be oxidized. Uh, in this case, they are going to form glycoaldehyde. That actually is going to be the real reducing agent. So um, unless we can analyze those intermediates, actually, it's very hard to know the exact mechanism. But the trend is going to be a uh, decrease in the order of chain lengths. Okay, the longer the chain lengths, the bigger they are re reducing power. So the second question is... Okay, so thank you for the inspiring talk that we did such control over shape. Do other more common materials reach an acceptable level of performance compared to the layer noble metal? Okay, so um, in terms of uh, other metals, uh, for iron actually, there are quite some report and the cobalt, of course, too. But in terms of shape control, I have to say, uh, really for noble metals actually, that has been the focus for uh, many, many research groups. But I believe, you know, what we have accomplished for novel matters should be extendable to other matters, okay, um, in, to other transition matters, uh, 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 basically, in particular for those with the FCC structure. You should have very similar trend, I believe, because their crystal structures are more or less the same. But for transition matters, you also have other crystal structures. And then the shapes, the controls could be very different, okay. If you go to like a body center cubic, and because the surface structure is very different, and then you are going to have, uh, you need to probably need to use different tricks. But the concept and the ideas uh, should be extendable, I believe, uh, including this reduction kinetics and also the capping agents and so on and so forth. That should be uh, extendable. Okay, thanks, Yunnan. Then I have one question. Yes. So, you show the, the a number of the very interesting the particle designing the, the for example the cube structures hollow structures and small particle and also the recently the single atom the base catalyst are world widely the investigated so could you give some comment the future the direction of this kind of the the particle the the catalyst the designing Sure, okay. Um, major difference between single atom and the nanocrystals is that for nanocrystals, we can rely on surface structures because when the nanoparticles are large enough, they are going to have pretty large facets on the surface. And in this case, you can control their activity and the selectivity by engineering the facet or engineering the surface structure. 
for single atom, actually, it's very different because you don't have a facet. You don't, you don't even have a surface structure. It's only one atom, basically. But in that case, you can engineer the electronic structure of single atoms through their interactions with the support. So, so actual support is very important. Uh, in fact, I could um, edited a special aesthetic issue for chemical reviews, actually. That special issue will be published uh, in October, actually, that contains many interesting review articles on single atom catalysts. So as you can see in that case, the support play the most important role because that really controls the electronic structure of individual atoms. And then you can control their um, activity and the selectivity. Thank you very much for your answer. And also I have the, another question. Uh, now the lithium oxygen battery, so yep. the, this device the using the oxygen evolution catalyst and oxygen deduction catalyst, and also the for hydrogen the based uh, the electric vehicle, hydrogen based the vehicle, but we need mm -hmm. the the good the hydrogen evolution the catalyst something like that. So then for those application, so we need the the low price the the particle. So could you comment for the, the real the application of the, your the materials? So for hydrogen erosion reaction, um, basically you have to use different metals, not the platinum anymore. So in that case, uh, iridium and the ruthenium, these uh, metals are going to be uh, more suitable. All this is really controlled by their electronic structures because uh, there's no uh, theory about the D-band center that will control the activity of the catalyst. So basically it looks like for each type of these reactions, you can always find the optimal matter or the composition, okay? That will give you the highest activity. And then once you know the composition, you can further engineer the surface structure and further enhance their activity. So that, that's basically uh, the strategy uh, to find the best catalyst for each uh, reaction you, you need to uh, catalyze. Okay, so thank you for the, the great talk, the Professor Yunan Xia again.